Welcome, everybody. This is Andrew Shapiro, founder and managing partner at Broadscale Group. I'm really delighted to have this outstanding session today on the impacts of the new U.S. climate law passed last week and signed into law by President Biden as part of the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. We can talk about the nomenclature perhaps at some point. Uh, but we're really going to focus, obviously, on the new climate law provisions, uh, and we could not have a more terrific group of speakers and guests to help us unpack what this all means for climate tech investment, for the climate mitigation movement, and for the energy transition. Uh, I'm really delighted to have each of you here today. We have Ari Matusiak, who is the CEO of Rewiring America. We have Robbie Diamond, who is the CEO of Securing America's Future Energy and the Electrification Coalition. And we have Heather Zeichel, who is the CEO of the American Clean Power Association. And all three of them are veteran leaders in clean energy policy. So it's really a, a, a true honor to have all three of you with us today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So Heather, since you were the last to join, we, we've deputized you as the first to go. Uh, and we'd love to get your perspective, uh, again, from all your years uh, working in Congress and the White House and now in the private sector um, on this you know, very, very exciting landmark new piece of legislation. We at Broadscale Group have been following the policy activity for many years since we started our firm 10 years ago. And I think this really is an historic moment. And obviously you've joined us many times in the past to talk about the policy landscape and how those developments will impact progress in this space. So let me start with you and just ask you to spend a few minutes talking about, you know, what this bill means, uh, what it will do uh, for the key priorities of your organization and, and really how it came together. Yeah, well, again, thank you for the opportunity to join you. It's always uh, it's always fun to be part of these conversations, and I always appreciate how um, thoughtful you are at pulling us together to talk about um, you know big and meaningful things when they happen. And couldn't be more excited about the passage of the um, IRA and and what it really truly means for deployment of clean energy and de decarbonization of the power sector. Um, as you point out, I'm the CEO of the American Clean Power Association. So I represent today in Washington um, companies, uh, over 400 companies in wind, solar, storage, and transmission. And um, you know, we're a relatively new uh, new trade association that's been around for about 18 months. And for those 18 months, we've been working very hard to. Uh, pass um, IRA and, uh, you know, it's in, in all of its many forms, first with Build Back Better and um, then Build Back a Little Bit Better and, uh, and everything in between. Um, but the legislation is truly historic at a very high, high level, I think, for, for a, one really important reason. The success that we've seen in the clean power deployment in the US to date has largely been based on a handful of state laws and the tax code. And that's kind of been like the equivalent of our climate policy across the US. And that tax code has been, you can sort of track, um, you know, the, the tax credits, the ITC, the PTC for wind and solar has only ever been one or two years long. And now we've got a permanent extension of that those tax credits. Um, so that is gonna be huge. It's a huge game change. If you think how successful we've been, as I said, at deploying clean energy year over year, now we do that with a certainty of not just one year or two years, but 10 years. Um, so I think, you know, the, at the heart of this tax package is, is more certainty and predictability for this industry than we've ever seen before. Um, uh, it, and, and I could give like the neck, I could spend the whole hour talking about like the provisions that we love, whether that's, um, you know, the standalone storage ITC and how I truly think that's gonna be a game change in how we think of storage as, as an energy source in and of itself. Um, the manufacturing credit so that we can onshore more of the domestic components of, um, of, of, of these wind and, and, and solar projects that we're going to build across the country. Um, so 
you know, at the end of the day, we think that, you know, our analysis shows that this, this IRA legislation puts our industry on a path to produce enough clean power to fuel every single American home in America. Uh, that's 142 million homes by 2030, and that's up from 58 million today. Uh, we also have looked at, you know, what does that mean for the average American in terms of energy savings and costs? We're looking at over $1,000 per year. Um, and, and job creation, how are we going to actually deploy all these clean energy projects? How are we going to, you know, create the manufacturing jobs that are building, um, you know, more component parts of, of solar and wind? Um, you know, we anticipate the creation of 550,000 new jobs and getting us up to about a million um, Americans in the clean energy workforce by 2030. All of this will also help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions about 40% below 2005 levels. So very historic legislation indeed. Um, we all know that it just came together and fell apart about 158,000 times. Um, and, you know, certainly as somebody, I was telling somebody I get paid to not be surprised, but I was really surprised that this legislation um, you know, sort of rose from the ashes, but I also kind of think it might have needed to die in order to come back together because until Democrats sort of stared into the abyss of what the world looks like without having done this and having failed yet at the second big opportunity that we've had in our lifetime to get something done, I think that actually kind of helped lay the foundation um, along with a lot of public pressure on um, uh, you know, on leadership and, and mansion to get back to the table and negotiate this deal. Um, so we as an industry couldn't be more thrilled um, that it, it came together and, you know, certainly more excited about what the future holds. Heather, let me just do a quick follow-up there before we move on, because because you are such a veteran in this space and um, know how, as they say, the sausage gets made. You were surprised. Uh, at the same time, though, you know, the legislation got no Republican votes. Do we have any concerns about the lack of consensus in sort of the middle of the political ground here? And, and could this possibly, you know, have been architected in a way to try to get support from more folks across political lines? So I think, great question. I, I point to a few things. One, America is deeply divided and we're in the middle of an election year. So yes, are there going to be consequences? Are, are people going to try to make political hay out of this bill? Yeah. Um, and if you look at like, where are the dollars actually going to flow? If you, you know, if you look at where's the majority of the deployment of clean energy projects, like there's a lot of red states that are really going to benefit from this. And I think it's going to be an interesting exercise in like, um, you know, like, do, do the Republicans touch it or do they not touch it? Like, do they do they give it a big hug and embrace or are they just like, well, that's nice, right? So, or, you know, do they say something, you know, far more aggressively negative? I, I, I think it's, I think that story is going to play out in different forms across the country. Um, so I think, you know, that's just the practical reality of the world that we live in today. I also think at the same time, there's a couple things that are like cont contextually important. The bipartisan infrastructure law um, also passed this year. And that was a historic investment in the nation's electric grid that passed with Democrats and Republicans. Um, and it, it has a lot on the, on, on the energy side of the puzzle um, and you know energy efficiency, deployment of clean energy, R&D, transmission. Um, so, you know, that just happened, not like the ink is still kind of drying on, on, on that legislation and DOE is getting that, you know, that, that bill up and implemented. Um, so, you know, I, I, like all hope is not lost in my mind that you can have uh, broad bipartisan packages um, that deal with energy policy in a meaningful way that get bipartisan support. And I think the other really interesting piece right now is the is as Schumer committed to Mansion, IRA passed with a commitment to revisit um, the transmission or the siting and permitting reform, and that's an area where it, in order to be successful, they're going to need to pass that on CRA. You're still going to need a handful of Republican votes. 
Um, and there's a lot of interest in what can you do to make the siting and permitting process be less um, excruciatingly painful. Uh, so, so I think there are these pockets of activity where we will be able to, um, you know, continue to foster bipartisan support for the policies that are going to lead to more decarbonization. Um, and I think consumers, like the consumers are going to see the benefits uh, in a world where high, you know, you've got natural gas prices remaining high, you know, wind and solar are going to be a nice hedge that is cost competitive. And, you know, I think states, I mean, you look at the states that are deploying the most clean energy and, and you know, you've got Iowa and Texas that are vying for the number one spot on wind. You've got, you know, Iowa going gangbusters on solar. You've got Arkansas and Oklahoma um, that are, are doubling down on, on wind. So, you know, I, I think all of these things are going to kind of scramble the map a little bit, but also give industry an opportunity to kind of step into that void and, and, and you know, really help foster a conversation about an all of the above energy approach with with um, with the Republican side of the aisle. And, and I'm I'm actually quite optimistic that we're, you know, especially whether that's offshore wind or hydrogen or storage, I think we've got a we've got a great opportunity to, um, you know, bring to underscore the opportunity with with renewables to the Republican side of the aisle and and um, you know, I, I, I certainly do not give up hope that we're going to be able to continue to build bipartisan consensus around the clean energy agenda. Terrific. Thanks for that opening remark. Uh, Robbie, let's go over to you. You've been in this also for a very long time and you've worked with uh, a variety of constituencies in the business community and elsewhere. Um, what's your take about where, where we stand as a result of this law? What are the impacts going to be, especially for vehicle electrification? Right. So it's always uh, difficult. First of all, thank you for having me. Difficult to follow Heather because uh, we tend to agree on a, a lot of things, although I haven't seen her in a while. Hello, Heather. <laughs> um, so that's the reason I said I would do this. So I could say hi to Heather. So um, let me let me say I run SAFE. Actually, we changed our name from Securing America's Future Energy because we have sort of a global portfolio. OK. Uh, as a Canadian, I thought it was really cool to put America in the title because you know, people would be really supportive. Um, but then I realized it's also limiting. And um, and so, and the Electrification Coalition, and for 20 years now, we've put four-star admirals and generals and CEOs together to talk about why we need to produce uh, what energy we can domestically, uh, why this is an economic and national security issue, so just put climate aside, produce what we can uh, domestically of all forms of energy with the highest environmental standards, use it as efficiently as possible, so we squeeze as much economic activity out of every barrel or every you know, BCF or every I don't know, rotation of the a kilowatt. Um, and then finally, you know, electrify. So we're not, um, you know, we have a diverse set of fuels into our transportation sector. And this has grown to autonomy um, and other. Um, we also created just a critical mineral center, a semiconductor center, and a material center because we became very concerned two years ago how we go from the Saudi, what we call the Saudi fire into the Beijing battery, uh, uh, sorry, for the Saudi frying pan into the Beijing battery fire. And uh, really concerned about that. And I think that this bill, but as Heather said, really contextually, I see it as uh, three bills, AISA, you know, the infrastructure bill, the CHIPS Act, which happened right before, and this bill, which is basically saying we believe in an industrial policy because we can no longer compete um, in certain ways with um, with um, authoritarian regimes or whatever you want to say, and therefore we need to um, we need to put these uh, this money on the table. And you know, in classic American fashion, it's you know not easy. It's not just a price or whatever. So I, I think it's the con context of that. Now there are different provisions in here. Some of them, um, like the EV tax credit, that puts a very like. Uh, sourcing provision of building in America, not from what they call entities of concern and, you know, various, various uh, things in it versus, you know, other credits that have no sourcing provisions. So it's like two different people wrote a bill and they put them together and they're not all doing the same thing. The other reason why I say you have to put them together, especially on the EV side, is there were $6 billion, for example, for minerals and, and uh, mining processing, you know, all these things in, in the first, you know, in the bipartisan bill. So uh, I just think it's a statement from where the country wants to go. 
Um, I can talk about the provisions as well um, in each one, but you know there are of course uh, provisions to uh, sell the vehicles that the consumers see whether uh, you know there's lots of now uh, strings attached both on income, uh, price of the vehicle, and sourcing. There are provisions that allow for the first time there's heavy, medium, and heavy duty vehicles. Those don't have the same sourcing uh, provisions. We'll talk about that. Um, and limitations, and maybe that's how some of these companies just get around what they have to do with the $7,500 and they keep the credit. There's, of course, the charging stations and the infrastructure for charging, which both bills deal with. Um, this one lifts the cap and does a whole variety of things. And then there um, are lots of uh, manufacturing types of provisions, um, boosting, lifting caps. And then, um, then there are grant programs like the $3 billion to the post office. Uh, which also doesn't have sourcing provisions. So like I said, it's like two different people wrote it. Also building on what Heather says, I think the biggest question is this uh, question of implementation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people are gonna come like, are we just about to waste a trillion dollars or not? Because we can't build anything. Um, you know, can we, can we have a mine? Can we process those materials? Can we build manufacturing? Do we have the education to do that? Um, you know, fabs, uh, and all these uh, other things that are needed. And, and I really think that the, the clean energy future requires the environmental community in particular to not just focus on regulations everywhere, but to start rolling up their sleeves and figure out how to do it. And to understand that nothing is pure zero, nothing is no water, con you know, how do you make these things? They take water and then we take energy, um, a lot of energy. And we do not have the energy in the country and they take dispatchable energy. And lots of things they're on tribal lands there are you know all these things that like this bill in some ways wants to also solve every problem the world's seen and unfortunately that's not um capable so i do think that there'll have to be a serious conversation about things like nipa and other things that have just really not only held ourselves back but in other parts of the world uh they have the same uh, many of the same problems i think just in wealthy societies that have um political movements um I think on the political side, as you had asked Heather, I see it also quite quite similar, but I would say it this way, which is it's very hard to get someone to go from uh, negative, like Republicans, like I've been dealing with this tax credit for, you know, let's say 15 years. And I don't want to end like they, they want EVs. They're not against EVs, but, you know, but politically it's hard. But to get them to go from negative to positive is very hard to get them to go from negative to neutral. And all we need is to be neutral. And I think that we need to invest a lot of time and money to say like, hold their nose, this happened. And I think what Heather says is true, which is their states are gonna benefit tremendously, but they don't even wanna address this. Like that this is nothing that is a hot potato anymore. They're like, and then they focus and we get their the focus on this implementation question, which they really do care about. These supply chain questions that are you know, uh, uh, quite important. Uh, my last comment, um, which I don't know is, uh, um, but, but really concerns me, is this question, and, and although Heather, you know, rightly says that, you know, by 2030, every home can, you know, have the, but, you know, our system is failing, the system that exists. And, um, and I, I don't know how we, as we've seen in the Ukraine and Russia, when a crisis happens, everyone just runs back to do the worst thing. Right, so Germany clearly didn't want to reopen their, you know, not show their nuclear. They didn't want to reopen coal plants, you know, our diesel generation, etc. So we need to figure out a way how to invest in what we need, and today, but also be able to retire it early. And I, I think that's a real question facing all of our countries right now because politicians. The one thing I know about politicians, no matter what side they're on, they always make sure you can get where you need to go and fill up your tank at a reasonable price as much as they can and you can turn on your lights. And as we see blackouts or problems and things, because you know if you're not investing in the system you have. So the question to me is how do you invest in the system we have, retire those things early potentially, but not like not slow down the future and, and, and dealing with those two things. So I think we have like a lot of um, difficult questions and I don't think we have a serious debate going on on either side. And that really frightens me that there's a trillion dollars that you know, won't necessarily fix these problems and a lot will be wasted and a lot of time will be wasted. Great, thanks, Rob. I have a bunch of questions following up on that. And I know uh, we have a guest on, uh, Dan Riker, who has a good question about how we deal with some of those legacy systems and upgrading them. But let's go first to Ari Matusiak from Rewiring America. 
Uh, Ari, we'd love to hear your perspective uh, from Rewiring's perspective, uh, perspective there. Uh, sure. Well, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to be with you all, um, and uh, and nice to see you, Heather. Um, it's been a while. Um, so I'll just zip through a few slides because what I would like to do is actually talk about the Inflation Reduction Act in a bigger context um, from how we see it, uh, and therefore what uh, the we think the implications are. Um, so. For, for context, for those of you who don't know, we were founded in, in the summer of 2020 with the, the simple idea of electrifying everything. Our thesis is that electrification is a path to economic renewal and connecting climate infrastructure to our communities, specifically our households. Um, there, there will not be a test associated to this, but there are six numbers that uh, I'm gonna speak to. Um, uh, these six, the ones on the left don't map to some sort of lottery ticket that gets you some combination of the numbers on the right, just so you know. But uh, the first thing to say is that 87% of our emissions in the U.S. come from energy. Um, there are uh, the generation and the consumption of energy. There are other sources uh, of our emissions, but the vast majority, about 9 out of 10, 87% um, uh, of our emissions come from generation and consumption of energy. And if you break that down, 42% uh, of those emissions, those energy-related emissions, actually come from decisions people make around their kitchen tables. What kind of cars they drive, how they heat the air and water in their homes, how they cook their food, dry their clothes, and where the power comes for all of those things. Um, and the other thing that is true is that if you take a poll um, in the US, you will get some number that looks like 70% of Americans saying they're concerned about climate. Um, but in, in sort of, in the, uh, as a general matter, there has not been a real way to connect the climate concerned people to a path for action to feel like they're contributing on the matter. And this is where, from our perspective, the 42% number and the 70% number converge um, and actually can serve as a hinge point of our climate strategy in the US and uh, both from a climate perspective, but also from a political perspective. Um, if you go back in time, and if you are familiar with this, the Sankey diagram that started in the energy crisis, um, which was really an adequacy chart that the U.S. government came up with to make sure we had enough supply on the left to deal with the demand on the right. 50 years later, it looks basically the same, except we've come up with some other sources of energy. Um, and that, as Heather knows incredibly well, has generated 50 years of policy associated to energy efficiency, CAFE standards, Energy Star, uh, basically an adequacy strategy um, to make sure that the machines on the one end don't consume as much energy uh, as they otherwise would if they weren't efficient so that we have enough energy for everybody to go around. Um, but the climate crisis doesn't respond well to energy efficiency as a strategy because you can't efficiency your way to zero. And so my co-founder Saul was given a grant, um, Saul Griffith was given a grant by the DOE in 2018 to map energy flows down to 0.1% granularity. And that crazy thing behind him is the result of that, which is a super Sankey diagram um, uh, that did that, that mapping analysis. And what you discover is that the basic um, notion of these, of these sectors and these big blocks of how energy is sort of understood in terms of where its um, share is ascribed is a little sort of, um, uh, is a little imprecise. Um, and effectively, uh, what you start to realize is that there, the 4% um, of the 100 quad, four quads of energy in the US that we use as an economy is to take energy out of the ground, put it in a pipeline and send it to your house when you change your thermostat. But that hasn't historically been tied to residential uh, energy. It's been tied to sort of other sources uh, like industry or, or, or electricity. Um, and so as we sort of looked at it from a more granular perspective, you start to realize that the machines are themselves uh, very important to our overall approach. Electrification is a, itself an efficiency strategy because electric machines are three to four times more efficient than internal combustion uh, ones. And once you start counting it up, it becomes pretty incredible because if you just look across our households, there are um, effectively the machines that we use and that and that we rely on to um, uh, to um, to enable us to access the energy so that we can use the 
uh, use those machines is about a billion all told across our 121 million households. That's a lot of machines. All of them need to be electrified, um, replaced or installed as electric over the next 20 years. And if you kind of did that math, you'd say, well, that's 500,000 homes that need to be cleanly electrified every month for the next 25 years, which uh, we are nowhere near doing. Uh, and this is why the Inflation Reduction Act is so important, because what it is effectively doing in large measure, although there's a lot of industrial policy, as Heather and Robbie spoke to, uh, what, what the Inflation Reduction Act in large measure is doing is it is pushing a bunch of incentive on the demand side to meet American families and households where they are and to help them make that transition to start electrifying those billion machines. Um, and that is also starts to connect directly um, um, the value to um, uh, to American pocketbooks, because by our analysis, the average American household, if it had cleanly electrified everything over the past year, would have saved eighteen hundred dollars on their energy bills. It's an enormous amount of money when you think about forty nine percent of Americans don't have four hundred dollars available to them for um, uh, an emergency in emergency savings and that every hundred dollars increase in the median rent in the United States corresponds to um, uh, corresponds to a nine percent increase in the homelessness rate. Eighteen hundred dollars of money back in people's pockets because they are access and locking in lower cost and uh, anti-inflationary sources of energy through electric and efficient machines um, is a very powerful uh, economic, political, and climate strategy all. Um, and it puts really, from a climate perspective, the household at the center of our infrastructure and opportunity um, because what ends up happening when we electrify everything is we still keep the number one GDP in the world, but we run the economy on half of the energy as a result. Um, and so from our perspective, what's needed is to shift the market default so that the efficient electric machine is the most affordable, convenient, and accessible to purchase and, st and install. Um, and we need to do that within the decade. And the Inflation Reduction Act actually gives us uh, that opportunity um, to deliver on that promise. And so as we counted up, there are about $100 billion in, of that 369 that goes directly to residential electrification. Um, that's across EVs, solar, storage, uh, heat pumps, um, uh, rebates, tax credits, low cost financing. Um, and um, if we if we deploy this money well, as Robbie said, it will result in the largest wealth transfer from energy producers to energy consumers in the history of the country. Um, it is an enormously powerful tool um, if it is done well. Um, but that is the whole point, uh, which is it's only it's only true if we make it true. Um, because the way to think about the IRA is that a lot of the money is actually potential. Um, it depends on uptake. It depends on its actual usage. Um, and so when you think about the $100 billion for residential electrification, most of that is coming in the form of, of tax credits, um, and the remainder is in rebates, um, and, then, and then it is sort of uh, enabled through low-cost financing. Well, there's no requirement that I go out and buy a heat pump tomorrow. It is only if I decide to do that, can I access those dollars. And so the way I like to think about it is that the Inflation Reduction Act has created a climate account for every American household. But not every American household knows that they have that account. They don't know the password to their account and they don't know what they can spend the money on from that account. That and that climate account that every American household is getting from the Inflation Reduction Act is also connected to a climate savings account that every household can access that $1,800 of savings a year. But those, the first one needs to be accessed in order to, to get access to the second. And so we need to make sure that we are educating Americans about the value of what it's, what, about the fact that they have an account, that they can access it and how to do that so that we can make good on the potential number. Because if we make good on that $100 billion, which by the way, could be less, it could also be more if we deploy well, um, it has the potential to unlock trillions of dollars of additional capital for market transition and policy alignment.
And so we, I'll just close by saying we did, uh, we did on the day that the president signed the bill into law, we, we released a calculator uh, to compile all these different things very simply into you typing in your zip code, what kind of house you live in and how many people live in your house um, and getting access to information about what benefits are available to you. In uh, four days, we had 155,000 people come to that calculator and 118,000 people use it, spending an average of 12 minutes on that tool. We didn't promote it. We didn't pay anything to promote it. It was all through um, uh, earned media coverage. And that tells me very clearly that there is going to be a lot of interest and appetite in un people understanding what's available to them and how to use it. And so for our, from our perspective, what's required to make good on the Inflation Reduction Act are three things, and then I'll stop. Um, the first is to, is to help every American make their basic electrification plan. So to understand how these machines work together, what, uh, how I access my savings, how I think about the purchases that are coming up, um, becomes incredibly important as a tool for helping uh, people access those dollars. Um, the second is to, is to leverage the fact that there is so much capital going to American households as a way to harness additional private sector action um, to support, uh, to put further capital on the table and further incentives for American families. And the last thing I'll say is that we really need to think about this in terms of aggregating local demand. When you think about electric, there's no such thing as an electrification market. There's actually no such thing as a home improvement market. There's no such thing as a national solar market. It is all down to the local level. It is based on like installers that, that work in markets that have customers. They are themselves small businesses that are responsive to uh, what the market is saying it wants. And so we need to ensure that we're aggregating demand at the, at the metro and community level so that it enables the workforce and the small businesses that employ those workers to plan for that transition and to participate in it, as opposed to saying, you know what, this is a little too new for me and uh, I don't think it makes sense. So um, I'll stop there, Andrew, but that's some, some thoughts. Terrific. Thank you, Ari. All three of you really uh, interesting perspectives. I'm going to start with one or two more questions for all of you, and then we're going to jump into questions from, we've already got a bunch here. Um, first, you've all noted that this is not sort of your father's or grandfather's or mother's or grandmother's climate bill, right? This is not a cap and trade or clean power plan. This is a very much a incentive driven, demand side driven, as you said, Ari, uh, provision and law. And that's interesting, and I want to get a little bit more context from each of you on what that means, because it does require the implementation to really work, right? As you say, Ari, there's sort of the equivalent of a savings account here, but people have to tap it. And then the second part of the question is, what does that mean for, you know, most of us here in the Zoom are involved in one way or another in climate tech investment? What does it mean for the investment landscape? from venture all the way through public companies, uh, you know, project and infrastructure capital. How do you think this will um, drive private sector investment to partner with um, the capital that's coming from the federal government? Who wants to jump into that? Heather, you wanna start first? You're still on mute, Heather. You would think after two years, I would not have that problem, but apparently I still do. Um, so on the on the implementation piece of the puzzle, I mean, everything I agree with, I agree with a lot of what Robbie said, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding here. Um, you know, I have, I, I have construction companies calling to ask questions about the apprenticeship language. I have questions coming in about domestic content. Um, I have lots of questions about um, uh, this, the transferability provisions. And um, I, I think, you know, as an industry, we have about, we have like a lovely spreadsheet of about, you know, four pages long of the kinds of guidance and rulemaking that are going to be really critical for our industry. And, um, you know, some of those are like important on a shorter fuse than others. Um, but, you know, it's just a strong reminder that 
passing legislation is one thing, implementing the law is another. And we're, you know, we're even if you look at the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed, much, you know, earlier in the year, um, or sorry, earlier in the term, the administration is now still sorting through like here are the 30 new offices at DOE that are going to implement this. And here are the new staff people that we're bringing in. So it's just a strong reminder that these things take time and it's not like the, the flip of a switch. Um, but I do think that this administration is going to be highly motivated to get that guidance done and completed um, just because you never know what's going to happen in, in the future, either with congressional leadership or, um, you know, will who's going to be the next president, all the, all those questions I think are going to really motivate the administration to move quickly, as well as the need to, you know, to address the, the climate crisis. So, I mean, we're, I feel like I might just set up a tent outside the treasury building for 2020, uh, 2023, because we're going to have so much business uh, in front of the Treasury Department with the guidance that they're going to be writing. But, um, you know, look, this is a good, this is a, absolutely a good problem to have. I'd much rather have this problem than trying to figure out how and what we could jam into an extenders package at the end of this year. Um, on the investment landscape, I mean, I, I, I think the opportunity is, is, is as huge as the trillion dollars behind it. Um, you know, and it, it, just in the days since this legislation has been signed by the president, I've had literally companies around the world reaching out to try and understand how they can take take advantage of the manufacturing tax credit so that they can cite some of the uh, manufacturing for, for solar and, and, and wind uh, in the U.S. Um, you know, there's, you know, to Ari's point, there are huge amount of tools that we've now just handed over to American consumers and, and families to have kind of control over their own energy future and make make decisions about different technologies. And the last time we did that with the Recovery Act, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, we, we really, like, that's when we saw things like Nest and, um, you know, Ecobee and a, a lot of those other newer technologies then really take off. So I, I think when you empower consumers, you're sort of empowering um, at the same time, you're empowering a lot of new technologies um, because there is such this pent up demand for the American consumer to be in charge of, of, of their energy bill. Um, so I'm, I am, you know, whether it's large scale, you know, utility scale solar projects um, and the, you know, the certainty and predictability that comes with 10 years all the way to like all the new um, hybrid projects I think you're going to see. I think, you know, Robbie will speak to, to the storage, but I think the standalone storage ITC is going to be a game change. Um, so, I, I mean, I think... I, I, I think we're going to see a thousand flowers bloom. Yes, there are some potential pitfalls and, and there are challenges with how do you like move all this money out the door in a meaningful way. Um, but, but I'm, I'm really optimistic about, um, you know, both our ability to think constructively about how we make this bill work for American businesses and, and consumers, as well as the investment landscape for, you know, everybody from, the largest banks and private equity firms to, you know, the new entrants in the space. Thank you, Heather. We actually have a question from one of our partners at Equinor, uh, you know, looking at American politics, is there anything here that a new Republican president uh, wouldn't try to undo and what, what in the legislation can't be undone? Can you address that quickly? Um, well, I, so, I think when it comes to things like tax credit, like, like ta tax credits themselves, those are really, really hard to unwind. I don't, I mean, honestly, I haven't given it a ton of thought yet, um, but I think it would be fairly unprecedented to reverse a lot of, a lot of the a lot of these core components because it's all embedded in the tax code. And I can't think of a time when you really reverse that. So I think because of the engineering, it's going to make it harder. 
Um, where where you are susceptible, however, is a lot of these a lot of these projects are going to be on multi-year permitting timelines, right? And so if you are, um, you know, building a offshore wind facility or a, you know, major um, utility scale project, there's a really important role that the federal government plays in providing the permitting um, for that. And you know, if if it wasn't a priority, it's already hard enough in a friendly administration to get permits done. Um, if it if it were to flip, and you know, there were controversial projects that an administration maybe wasn't as enthusiastic about, you know, you can draw those decisions out. You cannot resource the agency. So I think it would be rather than kind of blunt force trauma. I think it would be like more like a death by a thousand cuts kind of. Um, uh, rollbacks of, of IRA that that we would that we would be looking at, but I'm sure Ari and and Robbie have additional viewpoints on this. I can't honestly I can't let my mind go there quite yet. <laughs> I, I would just say I would just say I I don't I if I can jump in I would um, I agree with Heather. Um, I I think this is very different. Um, you know, the, for me, like a, a reference point. Um, in the comparison point is the is the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act passed. Um, it was designed to deliver uh, systemic change and also um, systemic benefit to tens of millions of Americans. And it needed to be built. The, there was no there was no insurance in exchange. There were no marketplaces. There were a whole bunch of regulatory regimes that couldn't be started until the bill was passed because the insurance industry wasn't going to play play ball until they knew until they had certainty about what was going to happen. And so you had something that was basically a sitting policy duck for two plus years, um, and then the website didn't work. But that's okay. Um, so, uh, so you had that, that was the policy context of, of, and that was the political environment in that policy context. Here, you have things that are available to people now. Um, the 30% solar ITC is available right now to American uh, families. There is guidance that companies are putting out to uh, contractors uh, today and, and, and over the past week um, to take advantage of that. And so I think it is, um, and I actually think if you like relate it again to the Affordable Care Act, it's actually, it is relevant because the Inflation Reduction Act has, guess what, a bunch of money in it to increase the subsidies or to maintain the subsidy levels for Obamacare. And that is because it is politically viable because people are benefiting from those, from those, uh, uh, from that policy. And it becomes, I think, politically kind of untenable to take it away. So I think for us, I am not as worried about the sort of the rollback dynamic here um, be, and precisely because I think so much of it was designed in part structurally because of reconciliation, but in part um, strategically from a policy perspective, so much of it was designed to deliver immediate tangible benefit to political constituents. The other thing I would just say is that the members of Congress are going to be customers of the policy. Um, they are going to be buying things that are electric. They are going to be sort of uh, have family members who are benefiting from these things. And, and, and it will become sort of, I think, in the zeitgeist much more easily and much more quickly um, politically saleable and sort of, um, uh, and, uh, sort of durable both. Very interesting. Um, Robbie, I have a slightly different view. Okay, can I, I want you to answer that, but I'd ask, I'd ask also, I wanna get Dan Riker, who we all know, longtime friend and veteran energy policy leader has a good question here uh, or a point about the provision in, in the law, the 350 billion of new loan making and lo, uh, loan guarantee authority, including 250 billion, which he described in the New York Times recently as the sleeping giant in the law. That's for something that you address, Robbie, which is how do we retool, repurpose and reuse old infrastructure and use it to decarbonize our system. So people are thinking about not just building completely new, but how do you take the legacy system and upgrade it? So can you address that maybe as well? 
Um, yeah. Um, well, first of all, let me just say on the on the other side uh, before I answer Dan's question, which I don't have a great answer for necessarily. Um, you know, I, on one hand, I do believe it's hard to roll things back. Look, the Trump, the Trump tax cut, which a lot of people didn't, you know, and the Democrats of all, all you know, both houses and the, and the presidency, they haven't rolled anything back. It's very hard to do that. And they don't. So um, I think on one hand, but at the same time, I, I think this is a little different than healthcare because um, like healthcare is very immediate. People use it all the time. Uh, their work, they, it's it's through their work, you know, that, or different places that they get it. Um, I just think like I was reading everything this morning. It's so complicated. And I was thinking like, okay, wait, I could replace my windows. Who do I call? What do I do? I, so I totally agree with Ari. It's like all about like, how does the average person, I'm the most, like, I would think I'm like the most in the know and I have no idea like what the heck I would, what I'll possibly do to like tap into this. And, and maybe the system will work itself out, but you know, I'm a little less, um, I'm a little less uh, positive that like, oh, these people, everyone's going to benefit. So then everyone know will take it away because I don't think a lot of people, a lot of people will really feel it themselves. And then, you know, you need capital to invest, right? I, the reason I can put solar panels and change my windows and do all these things, because I have money to do that and make a savings. Most people don't have that. They don't have the $400 and they aren't thinking about, well, I can't even get to my $1,800 savings. So I just think that this, um, you know, might be a little harder. And, and the way I think of it is um, I do think we need to defend. Like, I just, I don't think, and I don't think, things are good when it's 50-50. So I would say we need to fix, defend, and implement. Um, no, actually implement, implement, implement. Yeah. Um, and then I, I asked myself the question, who is like the Harold Ickes, you know, in World War II when we mobilized again for World War II, where we're like, in some ways, like the rules ma didn't matter. Like, yeah, we're a different society, but in 20, you know, in 1914, in 1940, you know, these are times where people are like, you know, is it, Lan is it Landrew? Like, no, no, it's not. Like, so something has to happen somewhere. Um, and I'm just, I don't know. I, I want, look, I want to see even this administration take some politically risky decisions on the supply chain side. I, I would say that would be a big stepping stone. Um, on what Dan said is, um, no, I, I think that's a, he's right. Now I think about both the uh, upgrading the current system we have, but also, um, you know, I am concerned about, you know, just, you know, the, the pipeline debates, the generation debates, like, like take Illinois. Uh, I was just talking to someone yesterday and, you know, they're retiring gas plants, but they don't really have a way to meet the dispatchable power and lights will start to go out. I mean, if you read the NERC reports or other reports, right? I mean, for California, and Texas, the middle of the country, we, we see these problems. And I, I'm just very concerned that over time, I, I do believe we should not slow down the future but if we don't invest in the system we have today, um, I just think like the public will turn against it. Like they'll just see blackouts and they'll say like, well, you know, I don't want that. And like, I'm gonna blame this bill or I'm gonna blame this thing. So I just, to me, it's like, how do you not slow down the future, even expedite the future, but at the same time invest upgrade as Dan said. And I think there's a lot of money to do that, but also look, we're gonna need, we're gonna need gas for a while. We're gonna need these things. and. And I just think we have to, have to be more realistic about that. And because um, I think a crisis is the fastest way to turn people off this stuff. And they'll just blame like, oh, they did this crazy energy bill and all they want is renewables. And look, renewables is a, is a, is not keeping the lights on that, you know, it's so easy to go after that. So to me, like, I think the environmental community, um, once again, should be really focused on implementation from the mines to the final product. Um, and uh, and then two, they need to be worried about crises in these interim 10 years, which is very possible, not just extraneous ones where, you know, someone bombs like in the Ukraine, <laughs> where, you know, the Europeans are like, what? Um, let me, but let me go too. deep, just in the interest of time, that's, that's a great setup for the next area I want to cover, which is to your point about implementation. Ari, how, how can we mobilize, we have a great question here from another longtime friend and leader in the space, Amy Christensen, how do we mobilize both the big companies, uh, some of whom are part of our corporate network and the startups who are doing work in electrification to educate consumers? Because we need a lot of marketing dollars to tell people. I mean, you guys are doing great work. All your organizations are, but how are we going to do that? Um, and then uh, we have another question from Badar Khan, another longtime leader. How are we going to make sure that the equity and access 
uh, is a proper, properly addressed as well. So that this isn't just for you know wealthy folks in the suburbs who could have afforded solar systems, but this is for everybody, including folks who can't afford a home, their renters or whatever it is, right? So can you can you maybe address those? It would be great to hear. Yeah, I, I, um, I have, let me uh, start start with um, uh, that last question, and I have sort of three three things to say. Um, the the first thing is at a level of policy design. Um, you know, we were very involved in the shaping of the of this aspect of the IRA, and there is quite a lot of focus on um, uh, disadvantaged communities, LMI households in the in in its construction. Um, and so um, the there's a and 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 also sort of like the related sort of elements here. So as a for instance. Um, there's uh, $8,000 as a rebate that is 100% um, and that can cover 100% of the cost uh, for a heat pump in the, in the, for a home that is making less than 80% of area median income. But there's also in those rebates um, $2,500 for wiring, $4,000 for a breaker box, of, up to a $14,000 rebate cap. Um, so you can imagine it's not just the appliance that is uh, uh, eligible for the rebate. It is the associated work and enabling infrastructure to pivot electrification. That's important um, because a lot of the, uh, particularly as you look in more disadvantaged communities, older housing stock, et cetera, um, there's a need to think sort of holistically about the, about the upgrade and not just about the appliance. So that's at a level of policy design. But um, it, it then needs to get coupled with implementation and education. And so one of the pieces in the bill is also this greenhouse gas reduction fund, which is $27 billion for uh, to drive uh, grants and low cost financing that can hook up with the rebates as a way to sort of specifically address uh, the transition for electrification in uh, low and moderate income households and communities. There's still gonna be need to be a lot of um, connective tissue with local stakeholders, with community leaders, with, uh, with entities to sort of create that translation point and to, again, aggregate demand specifically. But the good news is that there's a, um, uh, from a climate perspective, it's everybody needs to be participating in this. And actually the value proposition and the policy is torqued toward uh, being more valuable for low and moderate income households. The second thing I wanna say quickly is just that from, from a, from a, a corporate's perspective, one of the things that I think is gonna be very powerful here is that we are creating, um, in essence, like the largest carbon offset market through all of these machines um, in the United States. Um, and if you start to think about how, to, how corporates can start to participate, if we can aggregate these projects in a, in a productive way, and this is where venture and um, uh, business can come together, what you can start to see is um, uh, if you if you think about like the Boston Red Sox, they announced a, an offset of their scope three emissions at Fenway, and they're and they're doing tree planting in the Amazon in a partnership with a with a with a company. But there are a bunch of people in Southie who have oil boilers that would benefit greatly from heat pumps, and those are more valuable carbon credits than the than the forestation initiative but they need to be wrapped together so that corporates can participate. If we can create that kind of market, the corporate voluntary offset dollars will serve as an additional synthetic rebate to pull the price down even more. And it's a great town gown sort of CSR kind of play for companies. So I think that is an area that I'm very, we are very excited about. And I think is like a potential play. The third thing to say, and just is, I think we need to attack the levers in the market where people are doing things and, and make one moment of electrification uh, a setup for multiple. You buy an EV, uh, we need to work with the car, car with, the, with the companies, with the, e, with the OEMs, so that an, a 240 volt outlet where your water heater and your furnace are gets installed at the same time as your level two charger. As soon as that happens, you have reformatted that house and set it up to be electrified. Same thing goes for rooftop solar. Same thing goes for when we buy and sell homes. And you know the best time to knock out some drywall in your house is when you're not living there. So these are the examples of where these are major market levers that I think we can start to play to. And the private sector has a really important role in organizing that market activity. 
um, and leveraging effectively the federal dollars and using it as a catalyst for, for um, uh, initiating that work. Terrific. We have just five minutes left, remarkably somehow, but um, let me put a couple issues on the table and Heather and Robbie, perhaps you can address them. Um, some of our folks have asked about uh, impacts on other areas like carbon capture, which uh, is included, and maybe even geothermal and other technologies. Heather, maybe you can address that, and and or Robbie, uh, and then I think the other you know big question that we all have to think about is what's the next major step for the U.S. climate movement after this, and how will this impact the U.S.'s standing globally, and could could it hopefully get other nations to follow suit with similarly ambitious plans. Um, one of you want to jump in there first? I'll just answer the second question first, and then yeah. I, maybe Heather can do the first question. I, I would say one is, you know, no nation has the ability to print money like the United States, and maybe that ability will soon end. But right now we can just spend, 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 and that's what we've been doing. And so I don't think it can totally be, uh, yeah, that's what we've done here. We've just spent. But two, um, I feel like the two things we need to do are a lot of the environmental money goes to regulations like yesterday, even like, uh, let's just say California in the 20, you know, they won't have an internal combustion in 2035. I think if we spend one more dollar to get one more uh, state to say we won't have internal combustion engines or do something is a waste of money. The, the car companies have moved. Those tankers are shifted. They put all their billions into figuring out electrification. So now we need to help. The environmental movement has to get into the business of uh, doing two things. One is uh, on the supply side. How do we build these things in a clean uh, way? Because you know China is not doing it in a clean way. We just avert our attention. So I think it's really about rolling up your sleeves, making sure that uh, we actually can do these things and build and supply. Because right now we aren't mining the materials we need to do any of this stuff. Like we, like there'll be empty factories everywhere. So yes, you might be able to build a say we'll pay for this, but it won't exist. And then two is what exactly Ari said on the consumer side. So I think those two things are like uh, what, what we need to worry about now, but stop with the always, you know, the regulatory thing because we've moved the system already. Let's let's declare victory and focus on what's needed. Heather, we'll give you uh, your last turn and then we'll maybe finish up with Ari. Um, sure. So, I mean, I think I, I worked on a lot of provisions in this bill, but I am not deeply steeped in carbon capture and geothermal. I do know that um, there's additional, there are additional credits uh, included in the legislation. And um, I, I know um, that both carbon capture and hydrogen projects both qualify for direct pay. Um, so I think there are a variety of, of bells and, and whistles in there for, um, for, for carbon capture and geothermal. Um, I, and I, I think, you know, your last question about what's the, what's the future for the environmental community. And I, I do think a lot of this really boils down to how do we, um, how do we defend the projects um, and the investments that are are um, going to be happening across the country? Um, how do we build the workforce to make sure that we can take advantage of this tremendous opportunity? Because that's um, uh, you know not always an easy task when you want to ramp up that quickly. Um, and then, you know, how do we make sure that we are keeping our um, North Star of an equitable and just transition? And, and I think those are very much kind of pillars that we've, you know, seen from the environmental community, and I expect that they will carry those things forward. And I, I think, you know, for the first time ever, the United States is in a much better and different position when we engage in the international community, because we actually are not just saying like, we're going to achieve these emissions reductions with an asterisk and the asterisk leads to some like either garbly gook about a bunch of different regulations that may or may not be in one by a future administration or about you know some big comprehensive climate thing that might happen in congress but nobody really knows where the votes are we're in a totally different ball game now and i think that that gives the united states more credibility in the international community Terrific. Let's hope that's the case. Ari, your final thoughts? Oh, we can't oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I think the Inflation Reduction Act is fantastic. It's game changing. It's market tilting. It's historic. And um, we should see it as that. 
and um, take the opportunity to make good on its potential. It is like a giant ante to pivot the market. Um, and it is going to uh, rest on our collective shoulders to make good on its promise. And the more we make good on its promise, the more politically um, uh, sort of secure it is going to be because it turns out that the future state that we're all working so hard to achieve is a better one for American families and communities. Um, they're gonna have more money in their pockets. They're gonna have better stuff. Um, and they're gonna, and their kids are gonna be healthier. So I don't know, what's not to like? We should just make it happen. Um, and as we do that, it'll be the best marketing strategy uh, we could have for, for climate and climate policy. Great place to finish. I thank each of you, Ari Matusiak, Heather Zeichel, Robbie Diamond. Great conversation. We still had some questions we weren't able to address, and I, I can see uh, value in reconvening this group maybe in a year to say, how have we done so far? Because you're right, uh, so much is gonna depend on how we implement uh, and how we as investors and innovators actually change the landscape using the resources and funds that uh, are now available, thanks to the efforts of your organization. So we're grateful for the work you've done. Thanks for, to everybody who's uh, joined us today for the great questions, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, take care, bye-bye.